Hello and welcome to the Total Faith Show. I am your host, Cindy Ashley. I greet you each and every week onto your television screens, your computer screens, iPhones, iPads, all mobile devices. We are VOD, Video On Demand. We are also streamed live. Guess what? We are seen all over the world. And I am so privileged to say that I am honored, to say the least, to be able to have such a platform and to be able to bring to you lifestyle, entertainment, and news programming. To do what? To inspire, to educate, and more importantly, maybe even challenge some of you, okay? Because we here at Total Faith Network, we want everyone to win. We believe there's a winner in you, and we believe that it's time to change the way you think so you can be able to be a winner. And with that said, I want to introduce to some and, and uh, uh, read this gentleman who's here in the studio uh, here today in the name of Dr. Omar Johnson. Uh, he is a doctor of clinical psychology and certified school psychologist who specializes in working with the parents of African American children who receive special education and are diagnosed with disruptive behavior disorders. Um, not only is uh, Dr. Umar Johnson um, a psychologist, but he's also descendant of, if I get it right or wrong, Dr. Uh, Frederick Douglass. Kinsman. To Kinsman Frederick Douglass. to Frederick Douglass. Right. But I'm going to let you talk about sure. all of that. Listen, without further ado, let me introduce you again to my guest and now yours to Total Faith. Thank you, Good Dr. Afternoon. Umar. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the show. Johnson for coming. Prince. We're of also the prince of Pan-Africanism, yes, right? Listen, thank you for finding it, t finding time to be here, not counting yes, it as robbery. It's an honor to be here. I, I count it an honor to have you here. I'm looking forward to developing possibly a television series sure. with you, yes, so that we can really uh, inform our people yes. and and let people know what it is that is very relevant and important to us in this time that we serve. Yes, ma'am. So with that said, let's first begin. You're from Philly. Yes, ma'am. You're a kinsman of, why don't you talk to us about uh, that? Certainly. Um, I'm a kinsman of Frederick Douglass. Um, ironically enough, Monday, uh, the day before yesterday, was the 203rd birthday celebration for my four times great grandmother, Caroline Wilson Bailey. And July 1st will be the 198th birthday for my four times great grandfather, Stephen Henry Bailey, who was the first cousin of Frederick Douglass and half brother by way of the slave master. And I visit their grave site every year. Mm. So that was actually where I was just three days ago. Oh, awesome. That, that, that sounds so, so uh, riveting, you know, and so real to be able to connect your yes, kinship with. Yes, ma'am. And I didn't have to do any research, so I don't want to take any credit. That was already <laughs> done by the family. So I was kind gotcha. of born. With into that. the okay. information. Okay. College is great, but before you enroll, which do you think is a better way to earn your degree? Live on campus in a dorm where you can't sleep, with a roommate you can't stand, attend lectures that you can't hear, with cafeteria food that you can't eat, or learn online at Independence University. On the porch with your puppy, in the kitchen with your kitten, on your bed with your bunny, your campus is wherever you want it to be. That's Independence University. And you'll also get a laptop and tablet to use in school, and you can keep it when you graduate. 
This is important news from the diabetic supply line. If you, a friend, or a family member has diabetes and you have lost your supplier, or if you need a supplier for your diabetic supplies, you may qualify to get your diabetic testing supplies now with little or no out-of-pocket cost, regardless of your age. To be potentially eligible, you only need Medicare or private insurance. Call the diabetic supply line now. Operators are standing by to take your call. Call now. Well, listen, you know, you're doing some great work uh, mm -hmm. as, um, uh, as, a psych as a psychologist, and, and especially with our um, youth, particularly our black, uh, our children, our black yes, boys, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're going to dive right in. But before we dive into that, um, let's, I like for my audience to feel the synergy of you. You mm -hmm. just shared about your kingsmanship to Frederick Douglass and, and so forth. Why don't you also tell us, are you married? Do you have children like we yes, like to? Yes, ma'am. I'm one of 11 children. I'm the oldest boy. I have two daughters. Uh, my baby girl just turned six years old. Mm. Uh, my oldest daughter, she's 15 years old, so we're six and 15. I was used to saying <laughs> five and 15, but now I have to switch it up. Okay. It's six and 15. Never been married, lived alone my entire life. Okay. Uh, as you said, I'm a school psychologist, doctor of clinical psychology. I work in charter schools throughout the country, public school systems, primarily evaluating children for special ed disability determinations, mm -hmm. that's the learning disability, sure. autism, the reading problems, mm -hmm. the mild mental retardations, the ADHDs, mm -hmm. the conduct disorders. But I find myself more uh, than just evaluating the children, I find myself educating our parents so that they can stop the school to prison pipeline before it starts yes. because special ed is often the catalyst that gets the school to prison pipeline process started. Wow, that segues right into what I would like to talk about, the mm -hmm. school to prison pipeline. Like that is real. And mm -hmm. I mean, let's talk about that if you would. I know mm -hmm. you're here, you're gonna be lecturing uh, in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we're, uh, we're very fortunate that you are in New York at this yes, time. So we're able to have you here. So with that said, talk about the school to prison pipeline, just for those who may have never heard of that phrase before, because there's people uh, who are watching uh, certainly. School to prison pipeline uh, generally refers to a process that sees more black boys ending up in prison than ending up with a high school diploma. And what I've seen in my work, and I've even hold, heard this from judges as well as attorneys, mm -hmm. uh, the school is over uh, passing the community for being the number one referral source of black boys to juvenile detention centers as well as minimum and maximum security prison. So boys, black boys, are getting arrested more frequently inside the school than in the community. So it's interesting because we say we want our boys to go to school, right. but at the same time, school is more likely to land you in jail than dropping out of school. That's amazing. And that then is... I would add to that, see, mm -hmm. we sure. have to put it within the context. Please. Public education in America was started to train Americans and of course following slavery, African Americans on how to work. So it was industry and capitalism mm -hmm. that forced the government to create education mm -hmm. so that the workers could be able to read, write, and count. How can you exploit labor if you don't have workers who can read, write, and count? The problem today is there's no longer labor for African Americans. There's not even enough labor for African Americans with doctorates and master's degrees, which is why right now we have over two million of African Americans who are unemployed mm -hmm. with masters and doctorates. So what is the purpose of school right. if there are no jobs, if school in fact was created to prepare you for the job? Well, I would argue that the purpose of public education in America today, which includes charter schools because they're also public by law, is to prepare black girls for poverty and black boys for prison. Mm. You know, it's amazing how you articulate, the way you articulate is so, is so riveting. Again, I say riveting because this is alarming to hear, you know, mm -hmm. this, you know, as today in the 21st century, like we're talking about uh, in, enslaving our black boys mm -hmm. and our girls, if you will, mm -hmm. to the system, which we think, you know, we, we, we have freedom. You know, mm -hmm. we're not supposed to be, you know, slaves anymore. Yeah. Why don't you talk to that? One thing that has to be understood, yes. when we talk about the challenges of African-American boys in the school system, one thing that I always like to highlight and underscore, the black boy doesn't have anything wrong with him. 
when we hear that, when a lot of times when we hear the conversation, it's mm -hmm. almost as if he needs a certain kind of school. Yeah. He needs a certain kind of teacher. That's he is. needs a certain kind of curriculum. No, he don't. He can learn just as well under the same circumstances as white, Chinese, Arab, East Indian, mm -hmm. Latino. He can learn the same way under the same circumstances. The problem is not that the black boy is different. Mm -hmm. The problem is that something differently is being done to the black boy. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's being treated a certain way. He's being educated a certain way. He's not the one with the difference. So this it's is the, deliberate. It's deliberate. It's the teacher with a different perception mm -hmm. of the African-American boy. For example, two research studies that came out. One said that teachers pay more attention to the children in the classroom who look the most like their own and they spend the least amount of attention on the children who look the least like their own. So mm -hmm. if 93% of America's teachers are middle class white females, and if the research coming from America's leading universities is accurate, mm -hmm. that means a dark skinned, nappy headed, broad nosed, big lip African American student is not going to get the same attention as a light skinned fine hair, light-eyed African-American child. And if there's white students in the classroom, then they're going to get more attention than even the light-skinned black children. So there is Jim Crow mm -hmm. going on in the classroom without a sign on the wall. Wow. You know, that brings up yeah that new Jim Crow. I actually had the privilege of um, meeting her, uh, attorney Alexander, Michelle Alexander. Michelle uh, Alexander. Phenomenal woman um, mm -hmm. down at Riverside Church. But... Let's get back to uh, you with the psycho, the book here. Yes, ma'am. You know, psycho the academic psycho holocaust. Academic holocaust. Like when you wrote this book, and 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 rightfully so. Why did you name it that? As it relates to all of the work that you've Excellent done. Excellent question. In terms of your studies and Excellent your research. Excellent question, because the title was the subject of some controversy. Why would he call it psycho academic holocaust? Is he exaggerating? And I'm glad you brought up uh, attorney Michelle Alexander because her book on the new Jim Crow yes. chronicles the incarceration machine. Yes. My book chronicles the miseducation machine. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You don't even get to her stage if you don't deal with this stage. There would be no mass incarceration problem if there wasn't a miseducation problem. And we gotta be very clear about that. If we go back in American history 75, 80 years ago, who were the drug dealers? Who was being locked up? Who was running the gangs? Who was getting drunk in the street? Who was killing each other? Mm -hmm. It wasn't African Americans. It was Jewish, Italian, and Irish immigrants. They broke the law because America did not allow them to participate in its opportunity. It wasn't until 1940 that the United States government upgraded Jewish, Irish, and Italian immigrants to white status. Prior to 1940, if you were Jewish, white, or Irish, you were not considered white. You understand? But when they changed the status and made them white, mm -hmm. what they did in a lot of inner city uh, cities, what they did was they gave the Irish, the police departments in the African-American community, they were uh, disproportionately hired. The Italians were disproportionately hired in the fire departments in the African-American community. The Italians. And European Jews were given the downtown mm -hmm. civil service jobs in our municipal mm -hmm. government. So in essence, they were given an economic stimulus package. Wow. All black men are doing today mm -hmm. is occupying the exact same crime jobs that were occupied by Jewish, Irish, and Italians. The difference is the government gave them a hand up mm -hmm. and never gave us a hand out. Now, with psychoacademic holocaust, mm -hmm. I call it a holocaust because I consider it to be just that. When you look at the murders taking place, the black on black crime, yes. the mass incarceration, yes. I would argue that the mother of all crime is miseducation and the father of all crime is economic castration. For example, mm -hmm. what is one of our biggest problems? The breakdown in the black family. Absolutely. Most people think slavery destroyed the black family. Slavery did not destroy the black family. We were still married through slavery. You study our ancestors, they kept those families together even under the punishment of death or incarceration. The black family was intact at the end of slavery. It was intact at the end of reconstruction. It was intact at the end of civil rights. You don't begin to see the rise of the single parent black female home until the 1970s. What happened in the 1970s to cause the disintegration of the black family? I'll tell you. Tell us. The United States government deliberately decided upon a program of uh, economic castration within the black community. And what that means was they came into Philadelphia, New York City, Baltimore, LA, Houston, all the major black metropolises, and they systematically took out the factory jobs, mm -hmm. 
They systematically begin to stop training black men in the labor of the skilled labor areas, electric, plumbing, carpentry. Then they went into the high school. This was the most effective thing that they did. Mm. They went into the inner city high schools and took out the industrial building trade programs. Up until the 70s, you could graduate from high school licensed as a plumber, electrician, carpenter, auto mechanic, woodworker, mason. What happened to those programs? They've all been taken out. The skills that allow you to pay the bills mm. are no longer in the high school. And that what that's what's given rise to the mass incarceration campaign, the crime wave that we see, the drug epidemic that we have. And on top of that, that's what gave rise to the massive numbers of unemployed black men. It was a systematic move by the government to make the black man economically mm. irrelevant to the black woman. We're gonna take a quick break. Sure. And when we come back, we're going to take a quick break. This is a lot to absorb, a lot to take in. Again, this is Cindy Ashley, host of the Total Face Show. We will be right back. Do not tune away. We'll be right back. Listen to this important message. If you owe money to the IRS, you will want to hear this. The IRS is cracking down on those who owe back taxes. They send out devastating letters, garnish paychecks, and even put liens on your home or business. You may have heard of it. It's called enforced compliance. Penalties and interest compound daily on your back taxes, putting you under a mountain of debt. Tax 10,000 has years of experience connecting people with tax resolution specialists who will negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. Working through the IRS Fresh Start program, they will handle all the necessary forms and can negotiate a tax settlement with the IRS. It's that simple. And if you qualify, you may end up saving thousands of dollars, finally ending your financial stress. Now is the time for a fresh start. Now is the time to call Tax 10,000. 800-681-2198. That's 800-681-2198. Call now. Make us understand what do we do now for solutions? How do we make this better? The Please. premise of the solution is this. Come. And it's something that African Americans don't like to admit. Please. We're the only population of black people on earth who has the economic and intellectual ability to solve their own problems with minimal government intervention. Last year, we spent $2 billion on Air Jordans, $600 million on fast food, uh, $9 billion on perm and weave. <laughs> Black men spent $2 billion on Air Jordans. Oh my God. African Americans purchased twice the amount of Mercedes Benz as European Americans, although European Americans have twice the wealth of African Americans. And when you look at our Christmas shopping, my goodness, in Philadelphia, we spend $2 billion on Christmas gifts. In New York City, you guys spend at least $4 billion on Christmas gifts. In Los Angeles, about a billion and a half on Christmas gifts. You take all of this disposable income that we're wasting, we can have our own hospitals, mm. our own schools, our own supermarkets, and our own banks. Those are the four cornerstone institutions you got to have in any self-sustaining community. But guess what? There's not an Africa town nowhere in the United States. There's a Chinatown in every city. There's a little Italy in every city. There's a Jewish community in every city. Why is there no Africa town? It's not purely due to racism. It's due to the psychological apathy mm -hmm. and lack of concern that we African-Americans have about our destiny. And that is an artifact of slavery because we're the only people in America the only cultural group mm -hmm. who does not care about the collective progress of itself, number one, we're the only ones. And number two, we're the only cultural group in America who does not care, feels no sense of guilt or shame that our people are on the bottom. When's the last time you've seen a homeless Chinese? When's the last time you've seen a homeless European Jew? When's the last time you've seen a homeless East Indian? You don't. Because although no culture is perfect and everybody has, right. okay, that aspect of their community that needs to be improved upon, most of these cultures are self-sustaining to a point. Yeah, they get grants and they get government assistance, but at the same time, there is a cultural loyalty mm -hmm and respect yeah. that requires them to look out for each other. We don't have that. The African-American nation is a nation of radical individuals. Our psyche is our enemy. Our psyche mm -hmm. is our enemy. Until you change the way African-Americans think mm -hmm. about themselves yes. and their future, nothing changes. Yeah. Because before you can have an economic revolution, political revolution, mm -hmm. before you can have a cultural revolution, a family revolution, you got to have a psychological revolution. Yes, yes. 
talk about, you know, how about religion, um, church, mm -hmm. because, you know, we, we have so many, you know, mega churches. And, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the African-American church historically has been our vanguard. All of the progress, all of the laws. When you look at our great slave rebellions, Nat Turner was a priest. Frederick Douglass used to preach for the AME church. You understand? Mm -hmm. So black without the church, right. we wouldn't be where we are. Right. But the irony and the paradox mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. is without the church, we wouldn't still be where we are. So you have a traditional African-American church that brought us this far, wow. but then you have a contemporary parasitic economic based church mm -hmm. that keeps us where we are yeah. because it's not involved in any of the systematic struggles that African-American African-American people need. For example, where's the black church today when it comes to miseducation? Where's the black church today when it comes to police genocide? Where's the black church today when it comes to unemployment? Where's the black church today when it comes to poverty? The black church is nowhere to be found. There's exceptions to the rule. But when you look at the mega churches yeah. and the medium sized churches, yeah. none of them are at the vanguard of any of the major struggles for African-Americans. You know, you hit on so much and I, I wanna just jump in and I, I wanna hear you. I don't even mm -hmm. wanna interrupt you. Um, what about uh, the identity of through images? Because my thing is what I'm focused on is, uh, you know, the lack of images that we have or imagery that we have, especially for our black mm -hmm. girls. You know, that's my thing. Your thing is black boys, my mm -hmm. thing is black girls. How about the images of the propaganda that media, mainstream media projects in terms of identification? And I oh. think that has a lot to do with- Totally. Please. Psychologically yes. speaking, Please. images and sound are the two weapons of the subconscious. Yes. You understand? I don't care how much you teach a child. You could teach them for 12 years. The truth. Mm -hmm. Put one image in front of them. And like they say, an image is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. An image will condition that mind more than words because everything stored in our memory is stored as an archetype, yeah. as a symbol, as a picture. So images are actually the language of the soul and the language of the mind. And whoever controls the images controls the people. Wow. And when you look in our community, how many positive images of us do you see? And when you look on television and you look at the motion picture, mm. which is a moving image, and you look at the most popular shows for us, the reality shows, mm. they all do what? Show black women in a very uh, less than respectable light. Absolutely. They show black men in a very less than respectable That's light. Right. I mean, take Empire, the number one miniseries in America. And here you have four leading black male actors, Lucius, his son, Hakeem, Jamal, and Andre, four attractive, successful African-American males, right? And not a single one of them in that show has a positive relationship with a black woman. My routine is important to me. It's how I live, how I stay active. So when my back started to cause me problems, my friend suggested I call Medical Supply Helpline. Medical Supply Helpline helps you regain your mobility with back and knee brace solutions. With one simple call, you can start doing the things you love to do again. Whether you have Medicare, Medicaid, or have private health insurance, you may be eligible for a brace at little to no cost. Medical Supply Helpline takes care of all the paperwork. Call us today. Don't prolong your suffering. Get the support you need shipped directly to your door for free. I didn't want to hassle with my insurance company, so I made one call to the helpline and my brace was delivered to me for free. Now I'm back living my life the way I want. Now is the time to call 800-881-1902. That's 800-881-1902. Medical Supply Helpline. Regain your freedom, hassle-free. All right, we're back. Listen, this is a serious program. I'm gonna give you, Dr. Umar, without further, please speak into the camera. Let the people know about what the solutions are Certainly. as it Good afternoon. This is Dr. Yes. Umar Johnson, Please. Black America's number one school psychologist. And I have a special message for all of our African-American parents out there and parents in general. Three quick tips for the upcoming school year. I know it's summertime, but school will be coming right back. Number one, don't sign any paperwork that the school gives you unless you read it thoroughly. Number two, never go to a school meeting by yourself. It is very important that you have a witness to every conversation in the school in case it goes to court or goes to due process. Number three, understand that special education in and of itself is not a solution. And special education will not work if your child does not need it. In most cases, our children do not have learning disabilities. What I often find is they have lazy disabilities. It's not that your child 
can't learn how to read, he's not interested in learning how to read. So I'm saying to you, make them do the work, make them do the homework, make sure your children read. When they read, it, it increases vocabulary, it increases general knowledge, and you're gonna see the state tests go up with the more time that your child spends in front of a book. I'm Dr. Umar Johnson. If you need to reach me, my website is drumarjohnson.com, D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson.com, and my phone number is area code 215 215- 989-9858 and we want you to join the National Independent Black Parent Association. Reach out to me if you want more information. Awesome. You know, I'm just so thrilled and excited. We got to please I We will. We will. I I I pray so. Listen, without further ado, I just want to make a statement that Dr. Umar is going to be doing black intelligence versus black consciousness very uh, in the next couple of days right here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, we're excited about that. I know this is worldwide, but if you guys are watching in whatever time zone you are, just watch us and stay tuned. You're going to hear more from Dr. Umar Johnson right here on Total Faith. We're going to talk about doing a TV series because there's so much information. We need to get this information out because it's going to help. It's going to help. It's going to educate. It's going to definitely challenge some of you. Uh, with that said, Dr. Umar, your book, um, Psycho, um, The Psycho Academic Holocaust, The Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Our Black Boys. Make sure you check him out. Look, look, look. You want to go to and, um, and get that book. OK, without further ado, I want to say thank you so much. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Bless you. Appreciate I'm so you. happy to know you. Yes, ma'am. And with Likewise. that said. I, as I always like to close out, you are watching Total Faith Show on the Total Faith Network. We are seen around the world. We are over the air as well as on multiple online platforms. So we're very thrilled to be able to have Dr. Umar here. And by God's grace, we'll have a special series that will be promoted on Total Faith Network. And with that said, you know that all we want to do is empower you to win here at Total Faith Network. We believe in you. We believe in community. We believe in empowering people because unless you change the way you think, guess what? You will continue to keep getting what you've always got. Same results. We're looking for results. We're looking for change. We're looking for transformation, transcendence. We're looking for you to make a difference in your community, in your region, and in the world today. And with that said, I'm Cindy Ashley, host for Total Faith Show. And as I always sign off, we at Total Faith, we walk in total faith. Until next time. Yo!